And so we briefly talked about equilibrium once before in terms of vapor pressure. And we said that equi an equilibrium is two opposite processes going completely against each other, happening at the same rate, and so that it seems like nothing is changing. There are constantly things going in both directions, but because they happen at the same speed, it seems like nothing happens. Imagine a bucket with a hole in the bottom that you have a hose filling from the top. If you fill the bucket at the same speed that it drains out the bottom, the water level doesn't change. That is equilibrium. Okay? So today we're going to take that idea and apply it to a chemical reaction. So we're going to start with reaction rates. And so we have two pictures up there. They are both of reactions. So on the left, we have a burning match. On the right, we have a rusting chain. If you burn something, what does it react with? Oxygen. Oxygen, right? So on the left, we have a match reacting with oxygen. On the right, we have a rusting iron chain. If something rusts, what does it react with? Oxygen. oxygen. And so in both cases, we have something that's reacting with oxygen. But just looking at the picture and the title of the slide, what can you tell me that is distinctly different between these two reactions? The match will burn faster. The match burns much, much faster than the chain will rust, right? It's essentially the same reaction. They're both reacting with oxygen, but a match burns a whole lot faster than the iron chain. And it's a good thing that happens because if you tried to light your birthday cake using a match that burned as fast as a chain rusted, you would be 100 by the time you lit the one candle on your first birthday cake, right? And it's also a good thing that your, rust, your chain doesn't rust as fast as the, can, as the match burns, otherwise it wouldn't be a very helpful chain. So different things influence how fast a reaction happens. And so we can have two reactions that are very similar to each other that happen at very different rates. So when we say a rate, a rate we're, what we're talking about is how fast reactants are being converted into products. And so in this picture, the match, the wood, the little lighter part at the end here, is being converted to product. This, this is a reaction. They're reacting with oxygen to make things like carbon dioxide and water vapor. Okay? Same thing over here. The iron is being converted into iron oxide. And so it's a matter of how quickly is that happening. There are a few things that affect re reaction rate. The more, probably the most obvious is temperature. Usually, higher temperatures cause reactions to happen faster. It's not always the case, but probably 95% of the time, and especially in our cases, this is going to be the rule. Higher temperature causes reactions to, ha to happen faster. Also, we have reactant concentration. If you have two solutions and you're going to mix them together to make them react, if you have a set of dilute solutions and a set of concentrated solutions, the concentrated solutions will react faster. We'll figure out, we'll see why this happens in a slide or two. And finally, we have surface area. Just like when we talked about how fast something dissolves, we said increased surface area made something dissolve faster because for it to dissolve, it had to be touching the water. And so if you have a chunk of something, whatever is in the center of that chunk is not touching the water around it. Now imagine you have a chunk of something that you're going to drop in a liquid and it's going to react with the liquid. The liquid can only react with the solid if it's touching it. 
And so it's going to react with the outside of the chunk to expose the next layer. And then it's going to react with that. And so on and so on and so on until finally it's all reactive. But if you have increased surface area, say you ground, grind it up into a powder, now almost the entire piece of solid is touching the liquid at once. And so it can all react at the same time rather than waiting for the stuff on the outside of it to react first. And then we have a catalyst. Unless you know what a catalyst is already, this one probably doesn't make any sense. We will talk more about it though. But when you add a catalyst to a reaction, it makes it happen faster. So this is a look at how concentrations affect reaction rate. So over here, we have two flasks. And in the bottom, we have a clear solution. Okay? What we just did is we dumped two clear solutions into each of these. And then we put a balloon on top. When the reaction happens, it's going to make a gas as a product. And so this is as soon as you mix them. And then over time, we have this happening over here. Which one, the one on the left or the right, the orange balloon or the yellow balloon, do you think had higher concentrations added to it? on the right. We said higher concentrations make it react faster. So if it reacts faster, it's going to convert the reactant in the product faster. So the yellow balloon is giving off more gas, it's reacting faster, so the concentrations must have been higher. Here we're looking at surface area. So what this is, this is a glass bottle, okay? And there's essentially a vacuum in there. It's not a perfect vacuum because that wouldn't really be possible, but it's a, a quite a good vacuum. And then you can't see it, but up here there are electrical wires hooked up to the lid. And so attached to the lid and attached to the wires, here is an iron nail. And then over here is the same setup, but instead of a nail, there's steel wool. Okay? And the amount of iron in both cases is the same. So that, that's, it's not a matter of there are more, there's more iron over here. There's the same iron on both sides, but steel wool has much more surface area than a nail. Does everyone know what steel, well, steel wool looks like? So anybody who's not seen steel wool? Okay. Matt, do you know what a Brillo pad looks like? Basically that. It's, it's very long strands of, of steel, but they're very, very thin. It's almost like hair mixed up in a ball. Okay. Kind of like a cotton ball, but made out of some really fine steel wire. And so there's a lot of surface area there. Almost all of the iron, almost all of the steel is touching the air. When you pass electricity through this, and through either one, it gets hot. When you pass electricity through metal, the metal gets hot. And when you heat it up, you're going to make a reaction happen. And so it, how fast it happens is going to depend on how much surface area you have. So the iron nail, it's glowing red just because it got hot. But the only part of the iron that can react with the, the little bit of air that's in here is the part on the outside, and that's not very much. Over here, it's almost all reacting at the same time, and so you get all kinds of sparks. So increased surface area over here makes the reaction happen faster. If you had an unlimited amount of time, presumably they would both react the same amount in the end, but this one would get there a whole lot faster. This is catalysis. So a catalyst is something we said makes a reaction happen faster. The enzymes in our body are catalysts. That is what they do. They make something happen faster. A, a catalyst will not make something happen that would not have happened regardless. It just makes it happen faster. 
in some cases, in many cases, the time frame in which it would have happened regardless is so long for, for all intents and purposes, it wouldn't have happened, okay? Longer than our lifetime. But by adding a catalyst, we can make it happen very quickly. So this is a piece of liver. I don't know from what type of animal, human or not. Liver has an enzyme, with enzymes are proteins, called catalase. What catalase does is it takes hydrogen peroxide and breaks it apart into hydrogen and oxygen. So if you take a piece of liver and you put hydrogen peroxide on it, it's going to bubble. Now, has anyone ever used hydrogen peroxide to sterilize a cut or anything? Did it bubble when, it, when you did it? Yeah, but it doesn't work. Also, it doesn't work? No, um, because since they have that enzyme, the bacteria still actually lives because it can actually have catalase in it. Hmm. I've never done it. I don't know if it works or not. I would imagine, in terms of bacterium, it it's so small, if you overwhelm it, you could it probably... It like in the, in the bloodstream almost. Hmm. I don't know. But it, it bubbles. It bubbles, right? We have catalase in all of our cells. But the liver has a whole lot of it. So you probably didn't look like that when you did it. Yeah. Right. And so the amount of the catalyst will determine how fast it happens. If you put hydrogen peroxide on the bench, eventually it will break apart into hydrogen and oxygen. It's just going to take a while. If you go to the store and you buy a bottle of hydrogen peroxide and leave it sitting in your medicine cabinet in a year or two, it won't be nearly as concentrated as it was when you bought it. But we're talking years. If you have a wound, you don't want to put hydrogen peroxide on it and wait two years for it to to sterilize, right? So this is what a, a catalyst does. And how these things affect rate, the rate of a reaction, is based on what we call collision theory. And the collision theory states that for a reaction to occur, the reactants have to hit each other. That's the collision theory. So we have these molecules or atoms flying around. They have to hit each other. If they're gases, that's easy to imagine. If they're dissolved in a solvent and they're just flying around in the water, that's easy to imagine. If you have a solid and a solid next to each other, it's very difficult for them to hit each other because each atom is just sitting there vibrating in place. So the ones right on the border can react. But once they react, the rest of them can't. So remember, number one rule is the two molecules or atoms that are going to react have to hit each other. And when they hit each other, they have to hit with what we call proper orientation. And we'll see what this means when we see pictures. But essentially, if you have a molecule that's different on each end, I have two molecules, okay? I have a cap end on each and a bottom end on each. If I want to stick these two markers together, they have to hit like that, right? If they hit like that, they don't stick. If they hit like that, they don't stick. No matter what I do, they have to hit like that, otherwise they're not going to react together. So that's what we mean by proper orientation. And then when they hit, they have to hit with enough energy. If I take my markers and I go like that, they hit in the proper orientation, but they don't stick together. I have to hit them with enough energy to make them react together. So not only do they have to hit, they have to hit the correct way, and they have to hit hard enough to make the reaction happen. So we're going to take this collision theory, and we're going to apply it to our energy diagrams. So maybe a month or so ago, we first learned energy diagrams, and we had the exo and endothermic reactions. We had them that looked like that. And we didn't really add any more to them other than saying what was on the axes. 
right? We're going to take this, we're going to add some more detail to it, and really use it for a reaction. Earlier, we were just talking about exothermic and endothermic processes. And it didn't matter whether it was a reaction or anything else. If you lost more heat than you started, if you ended with less heat than you started, it was exothermic. Now we're going to take it and apply it specifically to a reaction. And so what we're going to look at here, we're going to add a step. Because I don't think before we had these little peaks on them, did we? I think what we actually had was something like that. And by default, I automatically drew them with this little peak here. This peak is specific to a reaction. It's what's called the activation energy. This is taking this same graph and applying it to maybe a more realistic situation. Imagine I'm at home. I'm sitting on the couch and I decide I want ice cream. Okay? If I have ice cream, I'm going to be happier. Molecules and reactions are happier when they have less energy. They want to get to a lower energy state. But if I'm sitting on the couch, and I say, I want ice cream. Number one, I don't have a mini fridge next to my couch. So I can't just reach over and grab it, out, grab it out of there. I also realize, man, I don't even have ice cream in my freezer over in the kitchen. So if I want ice cream, I'm going to have to go to the store. So I'm going to have to get up the energy to get out of my couch, to get in the truck, to drive to the store, to pay money to get this ice cream. So I'm, I have this little hill, this barrier, that I'm going to have to get over in order to get my ice cream. But once I put in that energy to get the ice cream, now it's all downhill. Now I can just go home, sit on my couch, and eat the ice cream. And if I eat all of the ice cream, I don't even have to get up to put it back in the freezer, right? <laughs> so I have to expend energy. I have to make myself unhappy in order to get more happy I started with, right? So we're going to take that and apply it to a reaction. So here is a reaction happening. We have the beginning state, that's our reactants. Over here we have the products. So we're going to take O3, which is ozone, react it with NO, nitrogen monoxide, in order to make oxygen, O2, in nitrogen dioxide, NO2. In order to get from here to here, we have to go over this barrier. The barrier itself is called the activation energy. So this is E, capital E for energy, with a lowercase a for activation. This is the amount of energy required to make this reaction happen, to activate it, okay? These, react these reactants have to receive enough energy to go from where they started up to the top of the hill, and once they're at the top of the hill, now they can go down to the products. At the split second that they're at the top of that hill, they're actually no longer reactants or products. They're called the transition state. They are halfway between the reactants and the products. They are stuck together, but they haven't come back apart. So imagine my markers are going to hit together, and in the end, the black cap is going to end up over here. So they come together, they hit, and for one split instant, they are completely together. This is not a reactant. This is not a product. This only exists for one fragment of time, and then it falls back apart to make our products. It's possible that when it hits, it could fall back to the left, and it could just fall back to where it started. But you would have no evidence of that even happening, because this happens for such a small period of time that you can't measure the existence of that, 
<laughs> so all you see is that these are still here. So you have to make the assumption that they never made the transition state. So this, in our, in our case here, you take the ozone and stick it together with the NO, and they've drawn these dotted lines here. Those are the bonds that are breaking and forming. So this oxygen stays bound to that oxygen, that nitrogen stays bound to that oxygen, and so there's still solid lines here. But this bond here is going to break so that this oxygen sticks to the blue one over here, and then just a bond is going to form here, and that is that bond forming. So we have reactants, the products, the transition state, and the activation energy. Those are four things that you need to be able to label on a graph like this. If I ask you, draw an energy diagram for an exothermic reaction, labeling reactants, products, transition state, and activation energy, you need to be able to draw this off the top of your head. You don't need these. You can just say reactants, products, transition state, activation energy. But you need to know those things without any prompting. It's possible that I'll also show you a graph like this without labels on it and ask you questions comparing the amount of energy between different things. If you look at that, and imagine that didn't say transition state. And there were no formulas, no drawings here, it was just a line. And I said, which has more energy, the products or the transition state? What would be the answer? Transition state. Transition state always has the highest energy. So this is an exothermic reaction. You, even in an endothermic reaction, you have to get over a peak. So you start down here, you go up over the peak, and then you come down. Because the transition state is always the highest, which means the products have to be lower. And so you're going to have to come down off that peak. The question is, do you come down so far that you end up lower than you started? No. Right, so over here in the endo, we don't. We end up higher than we started, so it's endothermic. Here, we went up the same amount, but we came down further. And so that one is exothermic. So this is what a catalyst does and how it increases the rate of reaction. So the red line here is an energy diagram for a reaction without a catalyst. So it goes up and then it comes down. If you add a catalyst though, the way it makes it happen faster is it lowers the activation energy. If there's a smaller hill to get over, more of them are going to be able to get over it faster. And the way it lowers it is it breaks it into two hills. It's easier to go over two hills than it is to go over a mountain. So it takes this, lowers the activation energy, and so the reactants more easily get over the, the activation energy to become products. It's also fair game for me to ask you to draw an energy diagram do all the labeling, just like we talked about, and then ask you to draw a second line showing the same reaction in the presence of a catalyst. So you can do something just like that. So maybe the thing where you have the most exposure to catalysts is in your car. Are there any car people here? I am not a car person. Okay. So in your car, in two places, 
There are catalysts designed to take the exhaust from your engine and turn it into less hazardous things. A lot of exhaust that comes out of your engine is toxic. And we can't just be putting all that in the atmosphere. And so we need to convert it, convert the toxic exhaust into non-toxic exhaust. And so there's a catalytic converter, which is just, just downstream of the engine. I believe the exhaust comes out of the engine, goes almost straight into the catalytic converter. And then also in your muffler, there's a catalyst that finishes things off. Things that get past the catalytic converter will get to the muffler, and there they'll, they'll be finished and turned into non-toxic things. So I don't look to that, to me, it looks more like a muffler than a catalytic converter. But on the inside of both of them, there is a very thin layer of platinum. And no, you're not going to get rich going around stealing people's mufflers to get the platinum out of them. There's not that much in there. You just need one layer of platinum atoms, and that's good enough. And so imagine this is the surface of our muffler. And this is platinum. If you have carbon monoxide coming out of your engine, you don't want to be putting carbon monoxide into the atmosphere. And so that carbon monoxide comes along, and it sticks to the platinum. You also have oxygen in the air. If oxygen comes along and it sticks to the platinum next to the carbon monoxide, it holds them in place long enough for them to react. It's possible for these two things to react with each other just in the air, and that will happen. But it would happen slow enough that you would have a buildup of carbon monoxide until it got to the point that it was reacting fast enough that it didn't build up any higher. But by catching them both here, you say, look, you're not going out on your own until you make friends with each other. And so go to your room and stay there until you come out and you're friends, right? And so they sit there, they react, and then one carbon dioxide leaves. And so the carbon monoxide stole one oxygen. So the other oxygen just sits there waiting. Oxygen is diatomic, right? Oxygen gas cannot fly around with one atom. So it has no other choice than to sit there and wait for another carbon monoxide to land next to it to react with. Okay. So that is carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. The same thing is going to happen with nitrogen monoxide. You don't want to be putting that into the air, and so when it sits down, two of them will sit next to each other, and you'll get two nitrogen and two oxygens coming off, like nitrogen and oxygen. Okay, so here we are going to draw an energy diagram. So we are given a reaction, and it's the decomposition of nitrogen dioxide. And it's decomposes to make nitrogen monoxide and oxygen. Number one, it says draw an energy diagram, and it says it needs to show the relative energy of the reactants, the products, and the transition state. We need to label the diagram with molecular representations of each. And so I said on a quiz or an exam, I don't need you to make the drawings, but in class, we're going to make the drawings. So number one, I'm going to draw a set of axes. First thing to do, always when you make a graph, label the axes. You wouldn't believe how many times I see real scientists with PhDs publish graphs without ax label axes, labeled axes. So what is on the y axis? Energy. Energy. And is it higher at the top or the bottom? Top. What's on the x-axis? Time. Is low time, early time on the left or the right? Left. And so as time goes on, we go to the right. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my reactants. I'm going to draw a little plateau for my reactants. 
Where do you want to put them? How far out? Hint is my answer. In the middle. Let's start in the middle. That makes it easier. So we've got that. Now, where do I where do I go with my line? Straight, up, down, what, what do I do? Make a corkscrew? Which way does it have to go? You have to go up. up. Have to go up. So I'm going to start here, and I'm going to go up. That's my peak. Now the big question is, how far down do I go? And how do I know how far down to go? It says endothermic. So how far down am I going to go? Um, you don't go below the reactants. Correct. I can go down as far as I want, as long as I go down some, and I don't go past the reactants. I have to stay above the reactants, actually. So I'm just going to kind of split the difference and end there. So these were the reactants. These were the products. What is this? Just the transition state. What is that? Activation. That's the activation energy. This problem didn't ask us to label it, but it's fair game for me to ask you to do that. So that is the activation energy. If you wanted, you could put just draw it over here. And anywhere that you show me, it is this much on the energy scale. That's the activation energy. Now the hard part is we need to label them with molecular representations of reactant products and it's this bet called it the activated complex. Activated complex is the same thing as the transition state. So the transition state is going to be the hard one. So let's do the reactants and products first. So what are my reactants? NO2, but it's important to notice the coefficient. There are two of them. If I start with just one of these NO2 molecules, there's no way I can draw it so that it breaks apart to make those products. It's never going to happen. So let's draw nitrogen as a black circle and oxygen as a white circle. And so that is an NO2. There are two of them. So I've got two of them. These are my reactants. I'm not going to draw them over here because I don't have enough room for the people in the back to see them. But these are my reactants. Now I'm going to skip transition state. I'm going to come over to my products. Again, these are easy. We said the black ones are nitrogens, the white ones are oxygens. And so it says I have two NOs. And then I have an O2. So those are my products. Where you have to think now, though, is the transition state. So what we need to do is we need to take these two molecules and orient them next to each other in some way that they can fall apart and make these three molecules. And so this is really a visual exercise. Take these things and move them around in your head and touch them in different orientations and see if you can get them arranged so that they can break apart and make those three products. Put them next to each other. Put them next to each other. When you say next to each other, do you mean next to each other? Yeah, end to end. So if I take them, Put them like that, they can break apart into that. Because as we break there and there, we have that one, that one, and that one. So yes, this one is flipped, but these molecules you can just flip back and forth. What you have is one oxygen 
bound to one nitrogen. So that is our transition state. And that is the better drawing. So before I go on to equilibrium, I want to go back. So what I want you to do is I want you to take collision theory, the idea of this collision theory, and I want you to use it to explain why these three things affect reaction rates. We, we talked about why a catalyst does. We said it lowers that activation energy. But how does reaction theory explain why increasing temperature increases reaction rate. Hot just move faster. You both have correct answers at the same time. There are two reasons. And they're both going on at the same time. So number one, if you heat something up, we said that increases the speed at which they move. And so if they're flying around faster, they're going to hit each other more often. So number one, if they hit each other more often, they're going to react faster. And then number two, what she said, was that when they hit each other, if they're moving faster, they're going to hit harder. So not only do they have to hit each other, but when they hit, they have to have enough energy to get over that hump. So if they're very cold, even when they do hit each other, they may not get over the hump. So if you hit, heat it up, they're going to hit each other more often, and when they hit, it's more likely that they'll have enough energy to get over that. How does collision theory explain how reactant concentration affects reaction rate? The more molecules, the more often they're going to collide against each other. Exactly, yes. If you have more <coughs> molecules flying around, the more often they are to hit each other, the more likely they are to hit each other. If you have a reaction container the size of this room, and I put one reactant molecule over here, and one over there, and we wait for them to hit each other, we're going to be here a long time. But if I put off a whole bunch of reactants over here, and one over there, they're going to react a whole lot faster. Because oh, there's a lot more molecules, they're going to meet in the middle, and when they meet in the middle, they're more likely to hit. Otherwise, if you just have one, they can pass right by each other, and then the one that started over there is over here, and the one that started over here is over there. They went past each other, but they didn't even know each other existed. What about surface area? How does collision theory explain why increasing surface area increases reaction rate. Yeah. Increases contact site? So yes. Two hit it right. They have to hit. That's collision theory. If you're stuck in the middle of a chunk of a solid, you're never ever going to get hit by something from the outside. So you have to wait for everything around you reacts for you to get exposed to the outside. And so these two just increase how often they hit. Temperature increases how often they hit, but also how likely they are to react once they hit. Okay, so that is reaction rate. Questions about reaction rates or energy diagrams? Okay, so we're going to move on to chemical equilibrium. So the first example we had of equilibrium was vapor pressure. And so the picture that we had for vapor pressure was of a container of water that was sealed on top. And so we say if you start with water in the glass and no water vapor above it, eventually some of the water is going to evaporate and become a gas. And more and more of the liquid is going to become a gas. But once it's a gas, it's possible for that gas to go back down into the glass and become a liquid. And the more water vapor you have up top, the more likely it is, and the more often one of those 
gas molecules will hit the water down at the bottom and stick. So eventually, you reach that equilibrium where the liquid is evaporating at the same speed that the gas is going back down into the liquid. So even though individual molecules are constantly going back and forth between the two, the amount of water and the amount of gas up top don't change. So that was our equilibrium there. This is the same idea. So over here, we have this molecule, okay? So we've got the two nitrogens here, and then there are four oxygens here. But this is going to decompose. So we start with a container that just has this, and this is what this compound looks like. It's a little tinted, but not too much. Over time, though, this will spontaneously decompose. On its own, it will just fall apart. And so down here, one of them has fallen apart. It looks like a couple of them have. So now we have some of these flying around. So these are high, more highly tinted. So you can see visually what's going on up top and then at the molecular level down at the bottom. And so we give it some more time and more of them break apart. So now we have more of these single ones flying around. It got darker. But when we give it even more time, it doesn't change anymore. Because if these two single ones hit each other, they're going to stick back together and remake this. And it makes sense that the more of these you have flying around, the more often two of them are going to hit each other and go backwards. And so you reach an equilibrium, the happy place where these two are hitting each other at the same exact rate that these are falling apart. That's equilibrium. So down here we have N2O4, that's the gas, that's this one. That is our only reactant. And it is decomposing to make two of the nitrogen dioxides. And instead of just having a normal yields arrow, we have that double arrow. That tells us that is in equilibrium. Okay? So that's saying that this is going that way but also that these are going that way. There are two reactions happening here. And so if you write it this way, then traditionally these are reactants, those are products. But in actuality, these are also reactants, and these are also products. Because not only is this going that way, but that's going that way. And so you could write it either way, okay? And so this is how you're probably most often going to see that equilibrium sign. But it's possible that you may not only see it like that, but you could see it where the, the arrows are one on top of each other. And so maybe you'll have that. You may see it like that or like that. You may also see it like that. They're all the same thing. You have arrows going in both directions. <coughs> now we're going to take this and we're going to add some complexity to it. We're going to calculate the equilibrium. This slide, and if you have no idea what we're doing, if you've never seen this before, this slide probably looks scary. It is not. Okay. Making these equilibrium constants is not difficult. So first of all, what we have up here is a generalized equation. Equation. So we have two reactants. We have A and B. Those are the capital letters. They make two products, C and D. The lowercase letters just represent the coefficients on those compounds. And so lowercase a is the coefficient on the first reactant. Lowercase b is the coefficient on the second reactant. If you have a reaction and you let it reach equilibrium, the fraction 
the ratio between the reactants and the product will always be the same. For that particular reaction, under those specific conditions like temperature and pressure, that equilibrium, that ratio, will always be the same. And that ratio is called the equilibrium constant. Constant for K, because I didn't want to use a C, and then EQ for equilibrium. That's the equilibrium constant, KEQ. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this equation and we're going to turn it into a fraction like this. And when you do this, what you want to have in your head is the phrase products over the reactants, or products over reactants. If you get that stuck in your head, you're immediately going to get past the hardest point of this. Because you're going to make a fraction, and on the top of the fraction needs to be your products. And on the bottom needs to be the reactants. So products over the reactants. Okay? So, on the top, we have C and D, and they are in brackets. The capital C and D are in brackets. Brackets mean concentration. For us, that is going to be molarity. So what that's saying is take the, the concentration of C in molarity and stick it in there. Take the concentration of D in molarity and stick it in there. And then they are both raised to the power of whatever coefficient was on them. And then you do the same thing for the reactants on the bottom. A to the power of lowercase a and B to the power of lowercase b and you're done. You're, then you'll just do the math and calculate it. When you put this into your calculator, just instead of brackets, use parentheses. The math will work itself out. Okay? So that concentration to that power times that concentration of that power divided by all of that down there. I will suggest make sure you're comfortable with order of operation, though. Because if you put that times that divided by that times that in a line in your calculator, it's not going to come out right. You need to go that times that divided by that divided by that. Or put this whole thing in parentheses. Or calculate the top, get a number. Calculate the bottom, get a number. And then do the final step. Just make sure that you know that your calculator is doing what you want it to do. Okay? I see that happen fairly often. The other thing that I see people do here, I can never, ever, ever figure out why. Instead of multiplying these, they put a plus between them. There's no pluses involved here. There are no pluses, there are no minuses, just multiplication and division. Okay? So I would be overjoyed if you finish the semester and no one put a plus there. So here is an example. So we have our reaction up on top. And so I say products over the reactants. And so we just said, though, that it's an equilibrium. And so they're both, both sides of products and both sides of reactants. When you're writing the KEQ, it's based on the order that they are written. So in this reaction, as it's written, the products are the NH3, and the reactants are the N2 and the H2, just like a normal reaction. If you flip this so that NH3 was on the left, you would have to flip your KEQ so that what is on the top and bottom would have to flip. So just remember how it's written, products are on the right, just like you would know, always expect. The reactants are on the left, like you would always expect. Put the products over the reactants. So this is a good example of the type of problem you would have to do here. Two parts. What is the equilibrium constant expression? Just read, tell me what is the formula, and then given some numbers, calculate the value of KEQ. So the first thing we need to do 
is write the formula where KEQ equals something over something. What is on top? Concentration. Concentration of the products. The products are on top. So in our reaction here, what are the products? NH3. There is only one product, so I just put NH3 in brackets raised to what power? Second. Two. The coefficient on NH3 is a two, so I just put that two up there. Now I take the reactants and I put them on the bottom. I have N2 and H2. N2, the coefficient is one, and so you're raised to the power of one, and so you don't even need to write it. And then H2 is Q. That is the answer to the first part of the problem. What is the equilibrium constant expression? It is that. You're done. And now for the second part, all you have to do is plug numbers in. Normally on a quiz or an exam, they would just flat out be given to you. Here they are, but they're going to make you read them off a graph. And so the concentrations that you put into this are the concentrations at equilibrium. Whatever concentrations you started with are irrelevant. All you care about is the concentrations at equilibrium. So normally, you won't even be given these initial concentrations. They're just trying to throw you off by putting this graph here. What we want are the equilibrium concentrations. So all I have to do is take those values and plug them into here. So KEQ equals the concentration of NH3, which is 0.28. Squared over the concentration of nitrogen, which is 0.06 to the first power, times the concentration of hydrogen, which is 0.18 cubed. If you do that math, what do you get? semester, I think there are two answers that are numbers that you can give me without a unit. This is one of them. There are no units on KEQ. It's just 224. The other answer without a unit is next week. But right here, we have our KEQ is equal to 224. That is the answer to the second part. KEQ equals 224. What we can do now is take that value of KEQ and use it to generalize the equation. We say, is a reaction reactant favored or product favored? And all that means is, is the top of the fraction larger or is the bottom of the fraction larger? In our case, what was larger, the top of the fraction or the bottom? The top. The top. How do you know that? It's a bigger number. If you put it in your calculator, you'll get a bigger number. She's just looking at this number, ignoring all of this, and saying that number is larger than 1, and so this must have been larger than that. Because if the bottom was bigger, we would have gotten a number smaller than 1. And so, the top is larger. Is the top the reactants or the products? Products. Products. And so this reaction is product favored. Meaning, once it reaches equilibrium, there are more products than there are reactants. If you had a reaction that 
it started, but then reached equilibrium before it hit that halfway point, it would be reactant favored, and you would have more on the bottom here than you would have on the top, and that would be reactant favored. So, if KEQ is larger than one, that means the top is larger than the bottom, so it is product favor. We say that it lies to the right. The right-hand side are the products. So we say the reaction favors this side. So it spends more time on the right-hand side. The right-hand side is the product side. If KEQ is less than one, we say it lies to the left. The left is always the reactant side, and it's the reactant favored. If the KEQ is one, that means it is neither product or reactant favored. The reaction is equal right in the middle. So we have reactant favored, less than one, product favored, greater than one, or neither if KEQ comes out to be exactly one. So let's do an example. We have a different reaction here. We're going back to our NO2 and N2O4. And so, number one, we need to write the re-equilibrium constant expression. So KEQ equals something over something. What is on top? Products. What are our products in this reaction? N204 raised to what power? It's the first power, so I'm not going to write it. On the bottom, we have a reactant, which are NO2, raised to what power? 2. Two. That is my equilibrium constant expression. I'm done with the first part. Now we go to the second part. It says, calculate the value of the equilibrium constant at 25 degrees Celsius. This is a little bit misleading because it makes you think you need to do something with the 25 degrees. The KEQ will change with temperature. But as KEQ will change, these concentrations will change. And so if you're going to use these concentrations that they gave you, it has to be at 25. So most problems you see won't even mention temperature. You're just going to use the concentrations that they gave you. So I'm going to take those numbers and I'm going to plug them in. I've got 1.25 on top and then 0.075 squared on the bottom. Put that into my calculator and what do I get? 222. That's the answer to number two. Number three is it reactants favored, products favored, or neither? Product favored. Our KEQ is much, much greater than one, which meant the top of our fraction was larger, and the top is the products. So this reaction is product favored. There really isn't a whole lot more I can make you do in this. It's possible in another class that someone, or more advanced class, they would make you solve for something. Like, take this and put an X in there and solve for X. We're not gonna do that. You'll have the numbers, plug them in, put them in your calculator, calculate KDQ. Okay. I think the last idea with equilibrium is called Le Chatelier's principle. And this is based off the fact that an equilibrium shifts and we can control it by adding and removing things to make it shift. The equilibrium will shift in order to undo the change that we made. Okay. So imagine I have a system at equilibrium. It's at its happy place, 
it has the correct ratio of reactants to products that it wants. Now imagine I come along and I add more reactant. All of a sudden, I mess 